Hello and welcome to eVeg 3110 Water and Wastewater Treatment. My name is Samuel Snow. I'm a, an assistant professor at LSU. I've been here for about six years now, I guess starting on my six. So I've been here five years since 2016. Um, I've been teaching eVeg 3110 pretty much every semester I've been here. However, I almost Exclusive, exclusively have taught it for the civil engineering students. So I'm excited that this is my first time to teach the eVeg section, and I'm excited to get to know you all. I do apologize that I can't be there in person um, this time because I'm traveling for a research conference, but I, I do look forward to getting to know you a little better when I return uh, on that Tuesday, the second week of class. So I'm recording this up a week in advance, essentially, um, give you guys some content for the first week of class in addition to the reading assignment I asked you to uh, complete. Um, and I also want to give you a chance to get to know me a little bit. We'll, we'll talk a little more when, I, when we're in person, let you have questions, and also give you a feel for the style of my lectures, how they will be presented, the, uh, the slides, the marking that I'll use for them, now, obviously, I'll be in person for most of this, um, but I will, in person, I'll have, still have my little writing board and my little pen and fancy little half glove thing. So I should be able to present almost the same level of material here for you in class while also broadcasting it online uh, for anybody that may be quarantining or um, out sick or anything like that. So hopefully this gives you a good uh, understanding of what this class is going to be like. Uh, today I plan to go over the, the basics of the course with you, go through the syllabus, um, talk about the textbook a little bit and what we aim to cover, uh, and really try to address questions that you might have going into it or essentially lay out what to expect for the course. And of course, once we're back, once I'm back there um, and live with you, then we can go over any um, questions you may have, any concerns, anything to that extent. So today, it's gonna to be an overview of the, the class. It'll be kind of a big picture, high level. We're not learning so much as maybe reminded of a few concepts that we're really gonna use this semester and making sure that um, you're on the same page as me in terms of what I'm expecting for you to have um, already mastered versus what we're intending to learn and advance the knowledge in. <clears throat> okay, so with that, um, be thinking about today, or whenever you're watching this, be thinking about uh, if there are things that you see that you, you really already know and you don't need any uh, extra review over, or maybe there's some topic that you realize, oh yeah, I could really use some extra review, because my plan is to give Kind of one more day of reviewing a few key concepts with mass balances, reactions, reactors, and chemistry. Um, but I could extend that a little bit if there's if there's some areas of concern. So we'll we'll talk about that when I'm back. Okay. With that, um, I want to just give a, a very big picture um, overview of environmental engineering. Of course, you all know this pretty well by now. But the way I like to look at water and wastewater treatment in particular, and this actually applies to almost all of environmental engineering, is that if you have some um, media, let's say water, and you've got some junk in it, well, what we want to do as an environmental engineer is often either design or at least understand what's going to happen to that junk if we send it through some process so that maybe we can get clean water with very little junk in it, and then a little pile of those little particles or whatever that we've now separated out. So then it's easy to landfill those or it's easy to dispose of them, incinerate, whatever we're going to do. The point is that we have either transformed or in this case transferred this mass or this material from one media um, by doing this process. So in the class, we're primarily going to focus on those processes here and how they determine these outcomes. Now, that's a very simplistic way to look at it, but I think it's also very helpful because we can kind of consider 
all of our efforts here are going into understanding what's happening to that mass. We know that conservation of mass must be maintained, or at least we're assuming so in, in this universe. So that's our, um, that's our fundamental um, assumption and basis for which we can design our systems. So we're gonna take that and really look at how advanced can we design these systems to have excellent control over um, the transfer and transformation of contaminants or um, constituents of interest in our water or wastewater. Okay, so we will get into both the water, so drinking water, and wastewater treatment um, with very, you know, with more specificity. Um, essentially, the first couple of units in our course are going to be drinking water treatment, and the last one will be wastewater treatment. So it'll be two exams on essentially drinking water treatment, although a lot of the same um, technologies can apply to wastewater. We typically disinfect our wastewater, but we're gonna talk about that in the context of our, our drinking water treatment, because that's perhaps the, the more common or more important um, area where we do disinfection. So for water treatment, we have these health standards and aesthetic standards. We'll talk about those in a little bit more depth, but those are what drive our drinking water treatment um, practices. Those are our uh, regulatory standards that demand specific health standards are met and recommend specific aesthetic standards. On the wastewater side, we are typically trying to protect intended use um, cases if we want to be able to go fishing or swimming or whatever in a river, which pretty much we do want to be able to do that. Um, even if maybe you don't care, as a population, we want all of our uh, natural bodies of water in the U.S. to be navigable, to be protected for um, healthy recreation, contact, non-contact, all the fishing, um, all of these things, we would like for them all to be protected. So a lot of our regulations aim at achieving that, um, assuming that it wasn't naturally in a situation that uh, could, like a natural swamp, for example, with no human activity, no human influence, may not meet all the dissolved oxygen standards that a, a typical river we would aim for. So there may be some exceptions, but in general, we are aiming for intended uses. Also, we sh don't want our rivers catching on fire. That sounds crazy and hilarious, um, but it has been a real problem that prompted a lot of our wastewater treatment standards um, back in the 1950s and 60s. So we'll, we'll cover that topic, um, and we'll also take a look at what it takes. Um, you know, we, ha we have a full class, um, EVEG 4156, dedicated to water and wastewater in developing countries. I'll be teaching that uh, this coming spring. COVID allowing, we're going to also have a study abroad component of that, um, perhaps going to Panama or Nicaragua. But re that part is really uncertain. I will be teaching the class regardless. I don't know if we can take a trip yet. Um, that said, we will, as we go through these sections, we will take a quick look at how technologies could be applied to developing country or um, point of use type applications. Okay, in terms of the structure, um, we are going to be using this, uh, this textbook here. It's uh, Gilbert Masters and Wendell Ella. Um, I've, I actually used this book in college. I really liked it and I thought it was a, had good examples. It was reasonable to learn from, um, a good mix of, hey, you can actually understand what they're saying and a decent technical depth. Now, I will supplement this because there are some areas, membrane filtration, for example, that this book really doesn't cover. So I've, I will add some things from other, other sources. Those resources will be on Moodle. Um, we'll take a look at the syllabus in a moment. It's essentially gonna say all of these things as well, but you can expect two midterm exams and one final exam. The final exam will be a little bit cumulative, in the, especially in the sense that 
we're building on the different concepts we've been learning and practicing. Um, but you know, about half of it will be on that new material that has not been tested um, previously. I expect to give you four homework assignments. Um, it'll kind of be like a on chemistry, uh, unit conversion type stuff, a little bit of review and kind of the physical um, physical processes. Then we're going to have one on sedimentation and coagulation, and then and that might include um, granular filtration as well. And then we're going to have one on membrane filtration, disinfection, um, and probably we're going to include with that the uh, water softening. So really more of the chemical side of things. And then the final one will be on that biological treatment aspect of um, of wastewater treatment, wastewater treatment in general. Uh, we do have participation quizzes. I call them quizzes, but the majority of the points will be earned simply by participating. So if you are attending class either remotely but live or in person, we'll probably be using Kahoot, and I'll explain that and show you that in person um, next time if you are um, if you haven't used it before. And so these will be, you know, maybe we'll use Moodle quizzes on occasion as well, but essentially these are going to be kind of jog your memory, make sure you're thinking about the problems and making sure that I understand, you know, where you're at with the material and to give a little bit more of a um, qualitative aspect about what we're learning, more so than just, can you do the calculation? Can you do a calculation in this condition instead of this condition? Um, which that's important, but I also think that there's uh, important things that are not necessarily um, as easy to test on an exam in the quantitative aspects that you should be learning. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the syllabus then. Um, in general, um, my, the details are here. One thing I did not mention yet um, specifically, I, I think I mentioned that I was going to offer live broadcasts for the lectures. Those are going to be on twitch.tv slash snows lab. Yes, that is a gaming platform. Um, no, I actually don't stream games. Um, although I do play some, that's kind of how I knew about it. But to me, that's just a much better platform to um, teach and to have live feedback without you all being distracted by each other's mics not being turned off and people making weird faces or whatever. So it's pretty nice because you could actually pause it if you're watching online, rewind, play it back. It will be, um, the recording will be there available pretty much instantly. Um, I will post to YouTube to have permanent, permanent links to the content, um, but it, it's a pretty nice platform in my opinion, uh, I especially used it because I had larger classes. So I might revert to Zoom on occasion if it's more like a review session. And I, I wanted to make a comment about this because you know, I don't know if something changes with LSU's policies. I hope that we can stay in person and that you can pretty much be in class. I think um, most of us, you know, I'm not I'm not particularly old or have health concerns myself, so I'm, I'm excited and happy to be on campus with you. Um, so, you know, for, for anybody that can't make it, I'm very happy that we can have this live session, but hopefully nothing changes. Hopefully we don't go fully online, but if we were to, we would probably, I would probably go to this platform. You'd have essentially this experience right now from my home, but you'd also have a little chat panel and it would be live instead of just watching a recording. And Honestly, you know, I'm, I'm doing these recordings because I'm traveling next week. And uh, so this is right now, it's Friday the 20th when I'm recording. And this feels a lot worse than actually having a few of you like chatting to me in, in the chat. So if it comes to that, um, in my opinion, I'll do a better job um, delivering lectures with some engagement there. So anyway, um, enough about that. So the textbook, talked about that. Uh, there's also some other textbooks that I might recommend 
for you if you need some extra supplements. Some of these are available for free on the LSU library. So if you do find a particularly interesting topic or you find that you wanna know a little more context about why this some, something matters and our book doesn't have it, I would definitely encourage you to look to these places. Um, just kind of a, a re repository here in case you need more resources. Of course, we have our objectives for the course, primarily relating to water and wastewater treatment, ability to design um, relevant processes, interpret um, you know, different diagrams or uh, you know, flow schemes, understand the mass balances as applied to water and wastewater um, treatment units and really focusing on the, those unit operations to be able to um, design the basic elements of a wastewater or water, drinking water treatment system. Okay, grading, I mentioned uh, briefly, but we have 100 points for each exam, including the final, 100 points for the homeworks, I'd say approximately five here, I think it'll probably be four for you guys. Um, and then a, a class participation. These will be those quizzes, essentially acting as attendance. And that gives me some room to, um, you know, award, award you if you're doing particularly well in terms of participating. You know, that's, that's something I reserve the right to return points. Maybe you missed the class, missed a participation score. Maybe, you know, you, you didn't, do well on the answering part of them um, and but you were continuously showing me that you were involved with the class um, i have in the past given people automatic 100s in class participation before because i felt people like people were going above and beyond and deserved it so just keep that in mind it helps me if you're participating it helps you if you participate and it helps your peers too because um, the engagement is a little bit contagious. It helps gather more interest in the subject matter from everybody if there's interesting questions being asked. So that's something that you can do for yourself and for everybody, really. Homework, um, pretty standard here. I expect to collect them in class. Um, I expect you to answer thoroughly, show your work, all of that. Um, Exams, pretty standard as well. Again, I expect them to be in class. I mentioned the final will be um, about halfway cumulative. Talked about attendance and participation. I will be using Moodle fairly extensively. Um, your assignments and everything will be posted there. In general, I will do my best to email you with a reminder saying that I've uploaded something, an assignment, um, something like that. However, I do expect you to keep track of it regardless um, and trust yourself to keep updated with what's going on. Maybe I will accidentally only say it in lecture and forget to email it, and that's really is on you to have been in class or to have been, been at least paying attention to Moodle to know that, oh, I have an assignment coming due. I, I'm not going to do that on purpose to you, but that is my expectation. Of course, academic dishonesty will not be tolerated. So the intended schedule I have here, um, and this this is coming from teaching, like I said, the uh, the civil engineering um, section frequently. Um, I revised it a little bit. Obviously, we have no class on Tuesday that that first time, and I'm expecting you to have in place of that Thursday lecture this this uh, today's session whenever you listen to this. Um, so that's the plan. And I have assigned a reading. So if you've not taken a look, um, we'll come back to it in a moment. But I, I would ask that you do take a look and read the assigned reading. Normally, I would have you do that later in the semester. But this should give you a good flavor for um, some failures and outcomes that came from those failures um, in a real world uh, essentially an accident or um, case of mismanagement type of thing for a water treatment plant that sickened hundreds of thousands of people. So it is a very interesting read. Um, I don't necessarily expect you to have every detail in there mastered, but you should be able to tell me, hey, what went wrong um, and why? 
<coughs> okay, so that's the kind of this first week. We will eventually have some sort of a uh, quiz or participation assignment discussion, something like that, for that reading. That's posted on Moodle. You should see that um, under the assignments. So then when I'm back in person with you, um, I plan to do a review on mass balance and chemistry, um, make sure that everybody's on, on the same page, capable of doing the, the types of um, equations, handling them um, that I expect. We can uh, elaborate on that if needed. Then we'll go into drinking water treatment, cover several physical type processes um, sedimentation, coagulation, granular filtration, flocculation, um, have an exam, and then go on to membrane filtration, disinfection, water softening, um, probably talk about advanced oxidation processes as well uh, with a guest lecture. Then we have fall break and an exam, and then after that we will switch our focus, um, plan to give you a, a seminar on the Flint water crisis, and then switch our focus to wastewater. And with that, we'll go through some of the fundamental wastewater um, regula regulatory frameworks. Um, what kinds of uh, parameters are we interested in and why? And how to understand the effects of a particularly dissolved oxygen um, and dissolved oxygen or oxygen demanding substances downstream of a wastewater discharge. Um, we'll take a, a quick look at nutrient removal and residuals management. So um, what you get when you treat wastewater and then you have a bunch of solid goop to deal with. Solid goop might be an oxymoron, but you know, the stuff left over. And then our final exam. And as of uh, yesterday, the LSU had, um, LSU's website did have an expected exam time, so that is current to the best of my knowledge. So we'll check on that before the exam, final exam comes up. Okay, so that's kind of an overview of all the logistics and syllabus stuff. Um, I mentioned this uh, reading assignment. So just to give you a sneak peek, essentially there's a, um, a story back in 1993 um, Milwaukee residents were afflicted with um, months of watery diarrhea. And that, you know, might sound slightly humorous at first, um, just at face value. But this was a, a drinking water uh, outbreak. It was failures that had to do with the operation of a drinking water treatment plant. And Essentially, th this was actually deadly. So most people, you if you get this cryptosporidium infection, it's actually not a bacteria; it's a protozoa. This is um, this type of pathogen and a similar one called Giardia. These are what you might hear of if you hear of getting hikers diarrhea, or if you like you hear about somebody going hiking and they drank some stream water or something. It was pretty remote, but they they ended up getting sick and they were stayed sick for several weeks or a month or so, um, there's a decent chance that was a, a protozoa type infection, cryptosporidium or giardia. So cryptosporidium, for most people, if you're healthy, um, in decent, or at least in decent health, it's just uncomfortable for some time. And it's, you know, not a good thing, but it's also not a terrible thing. But for anybody immunocompromised, whether that was the ongoing HIV AIDS epidemic at the time, or if that was somebody elderly or afflicted with some other um, comorbidity, it could actually be deadly. Um, so this, this infection could be quite serious for some people and um, indeed many people died. So it, it was, you know, it wasn't just a case of, haha, sucks for you guys, you all got sick, you know, kind of funny. Um, that element is of humor might be there just at the ridiculousness of it, but um, it was also pretty serious and uh, tragic in that manner. So it, definitely take a look. Um, there are specifically a, one major failure, um, but a, really a, a set of several failures combined 
that led to um, this outbreak. And certainly um, treatment systems have been revised and uh, enhanced since then and certain practices um, have been changed. When we get to the relevant sections of water treatment technologies that were that failed in this case, we'll talk a little bit about those and describe what they did wrong versus what they should have done. Okay, so that's, and I'm asking you to read that in lieu of our first class, um, as well as read the um, syllabus and all that. So hopefully that will give you something to pique your interest for uh, the rest of the course. That's my hope. Okay, so um, you probably have had this drilled into your head by the eVeg faculty and instructors by this point, but mass balances are essentially everything we're doing. Um, and units, therefore, are critical to allow us to properly communicate and understand these mass balances. Conservation of mass, of course, is the very fundamental principle that we're using to, um, to make any comments about what's going to happen in our systems. The other thing about units is they can really help you solve a problem if you kind of forgot how it was supposed to work. If you're keeping careful track of your units, hint, hint, then a lot of times you, your units will show you the right next step because you'll see, oh, well, I have milligrams per liter over here that you know my problem is asking for me to report milligrams per liter. But over here, I got all the way to milligrams, but I'm left with just milligrams. I must need to divide by a volume somewhere um, oh, I, I see, I forgot to divide by volume back there because I was given a volume and I forgot about it. You know, that's the kind of thing that you can really save yourself some points and some headaches if you pay close attention to your units. So if you are disciplined with that, you will be rewarded. It will help you. Even if it takes you a few more moments of writing it out, it's going to be worth it. Okay. Mass balances, really what we're talking about are mass per time, or maybe concentration per time, rates. So we're gonna talk about mass balance in terms of an accumulation rate. Not just, you know, stuff moving, but really the, the, how much stuff is accumulating in some control volume over time. Think of it like a bank account. If you've got some income and some expenditures, those would be your inputs and outputs, and your bank account is your control volume. And then if you have interest, let's say you have some money in there, then that interest would be a growth rate inside that mass balance. And in that case, you probably want an accumulation if you are wanting to save. Um, you can invert that and say maybe you have negative money there and you owe money, and so your interest is actually owing, owing the interest. And so that's a decay rate driving the number further down. It's probably something you don't want. Um, so you can kind of think of that as a simple form of mass balance where you're looking at how the accumulation of money in the bank is happening. You know, you, you want to know what's happening. And a lot of times it's easy to operate a system if the net accumulation inside your container is zero. That's what we call steady state. Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to that, talk more about that, make sure that you're all comfortable with that in a few minutes and when, we, when I come uh, back and can um, talk to you in person. Okay, chemistry, um, hopefully you're not too shy about chemistry by this point, but we will certainly review any points that you need. Um, specifically, I just want to say that most of chemistry is all about those units. Um, so if you ever did have any insecurity with converting from molar to mass and back and forth, that's really just unit conversions. You know how to do that. You can do that. It's just a matter of, like if you do have trouble, it's probably just a small mental block and that should be easy to overcome once you kind of take a, a step back and and take a methodical approach to it. That's my hope. Um, chemical equilibria, 
will be something that might be a little newer um, or something that you've learned in the past but haven't really focused on and applied it. So we will be reviewing that and making sure you're up to speed with that because that's going to be important for our, our softening um, alkalinity understanding and also pH adjusting and chlorination. All of those will rely on chemical equilibria equations. So I do plan on um, reviewing that in the next lecture. In terms of unit conversions, I do expect you to have a working knowledge of SI conversions, you know, kilogram versus a centigram, milligram, microgram, nanogram, um, megagram. So these are all very straightforward. Should hope that you already have a good understanding of these and you know you would know how to convert a meter into a kilometer or a meter into a millimeter or vice versa. And you really should have in working knowledge the exact values for these guys and this one at minimum, probably mega two. That'd be pretty common. Um, so, you know, probably be better to have more of them memorized, but I would say centimeters obviously is very common. Millimeters, micrometers, nanomoles, nanometers, all that. Um, should be should be um, well within your working knowledge. Okay, one last note about units and um, and about the course in general. This table is what I'm going to give you, and this comes from our book. This is what I'm going to give you on our exams. So any time you need to reference the density of water or the dynamic viscosity of water, you'll have this table to reference from. And you know I'm not trying to trick you with this table on purpose by any means, but it can be tricky if you're not paying attention to units. So I'm going to reiterate here, pay attention to your units, because here the units are not just for the dynamic viscosity. They're not just kilograms per meter per second. They are times 10 to the minus third kilograms per meter per second. So if we looked up 10 degrees Celsius water temperature, and we want to know the dynamic viscosity, you know, you might be moving too quickly through your exam or homework and say, oh, that's 1.307 uh, kilograms per meters per second. And thinking to yourself, oh, good, I, I wrote down the units. That's good. I'm doing well. But again, give it some attention because this times 10 to the minus third needs to be in there. And that really changes. Uh, your answers if you're off by a factor of a thousand. Okay, so watch for that. Make sure you're you're careful with that. Okay, so a few unit conversions that I expect you already know, um, or if you don't know, you should remind yourself, and we'll remind you right now. Um, but this is these are some conversions that you really you ought to be able to do without thinking too hard about it. And one I would say commit to memory is how many liters are in one cubic meter. Um, there's probably several ways we can derive this from the, the density chart that we just looked at. And we'll get into that a little more. Um, but if you simply memorize that it takes 1,000 liters to fill one cubic meter, that will help you um, in a lot of other equations. The other thing I'm going to say is if you, if you take a look at that, you could also memorize that there's one milliliter in one cubic centimeter. Now, this might also look a little funny because it's like, okay, one milli in one centi versus 1,000 with no prefix to one with no prefix. And that's a feature of the cubed, the cubing the unit conversion. So let me just remind you real quick to pay attention to this if you do have to convert with a volume unit like this that's in um, cubic dimensions or, or even an area. So the reminder is this, if you have one meter, we know that's equal to 100 centimeters, right? So then if you wanna compare one cubic meter, you have to cube both the number and the unit. 
that's the part here because you can't just cube the unit that's not going to work for you um, you don't it's not the case that one cubic meter is equal to 100 cubic centimeters rather it's one cubed meters cubed equals 100 cubed centimeters cubed and that becomes 100 cubed is 10 to the 6 so 1 million centimeters cubed per one cubic meter. And if you think about that, you could probably visualize this in your mind, right? If you think about a meter being, you know, some large area, some large volume and deep, then that's one cubic meter. Now, if you think of one centimeter, you think like, okay, on a ruler, it's smaller than one inch. So maybe it's like something like this. And then you have a little cube. Well, if you think about it, do you really think that 100 of these little cubes this big is going to fill this entire cubic meter? Not a chance. So it helps sometimes to think about it as practically as you can to double check yourself. Uh, even better, make sure that you're doing unit conversions properly like this. So a little challenge for you. Um, how many grams are in one milliliter of water at five degrees Celsius? So take a, take a thought about this. Make sure that you can go to this page, take that five, go to the density, find that density using those units, and then convert those units so that you can answer how many grams are in one milliliter of water at five degrees Celsius. Okay, so if you want to do that on your own, pause and do so. The answer is one gram in one milliliter. And in fact, that's in some sense how we define the weight of one gram is how much water weighs, pure water, you know, how much one milliliter of pure water weighs. So you should be able to do that unit conversion from um, kilograms to grams and from cubic meters to milliliters based on what I just said. So I'm going to leave that to you. Of course, we can go over it together when I'm back if we need. Okay, so that's units converting with different dimensions. I also want to comment on unit converting with um, number to mass relationships. And specifically, this is talking about chemistry. Um, but I'm going to give you a practical example, or perhaps an impractical <laughs> example, um, a real world tangible example that you can think of to relate to the, the, chemis the chemistry concept of moles. Because moles is a number, and we use the periodic table and the atomic weights to convert from a very, very small weight of one atom of, let's say, lead to a tangible amount if you have one mole of lead molecules or at atoms. Sorry. So, excuse me, if we have one mole of something, that's a lot like saying we have one dozen something. It, it's really telling us something about how many, right? One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of that something. You could have one mole of eggs. That would be insane. You could have one dozen molecules or atoms. So the, the ratio here then, and the, the mass that we get from the periodic table simply defines that, you know, it would be as if we said one dozen atoms converts it from atomic mass units to grams except instead of dozen, we put mole. So that's the only difference. Um, you know, you could, you could take one, the mass of one egg and define that as an atomic egg unit. Um, and then you can say, okay, well then a dozen of these eggs, let's say extra large eggs, is five pounds or whatever. You know, that's not realistic, but you could define that as some weight right based on how much you know some something tangible so that's the whole deal with 
moles versus atoms or molecules. It's, it's just the number of them. So it's, you need that ratio of, okay, well, how much, how much does one atom weigh? And then we'll take that, if we get a mole of those atoms, then that's, we take that number and it's just grams now instead of atomic mass units. Okay, next thing I wanna talk about is concentrations. Again, hopefully this is just simply review. The basic definition of a concentration is the amount of stuff you have in an amount of other stuff. It's a very, very technical there. So um, you could have different denominators. You could have volume on the bottom. That's probably the most common. You could have percent by volume. So what percent of the volume is occupied by X? Um, you could have mass on the denominator. So you could have grams of carbon per gram of substrate or something. You could have milligrams of adsorbate per kilogram of adsorbent. You could have um, milligrams of some pharmaceutical compound that you're ingesting, maybe caffeine, per kilogram of body weight. So those would be some examples where you're using a mass, mass on the denominator. You could have a percentage by weight. What percent of your body weight is made up of bones is a question that you could answer with a percent by weight. Then we have parts per X, like parts per thousand, parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion. Um, this is essentially percentages just with different denominators. So when we say percentage, you recognize that that's parts, or perhaps you haven't thought of it this way, that's really just parts per 100 parts per hundred instead of parts per thousand, instead of parts per billion. So PPM, parts per million, is the same thing as a percentage, except it's that many numbers of them in one million instead of in 100. So 5% is five in every 100. Let's say five parts in every 100. Five parts per million is five parts in every one million parts and so on. So those can be used um, in kind of a few different ways. Just wanted to review them. We're probably not going to see them too often, um, but wanted to just kind of touch on those. Okay, so on the numerator, you can have mass. So you could have milligrams per liter of chlorine or something, or you can have number. So how many particles per liter and that number is where we get those molar units, right? So the, um, this example of a dozen eggs, right? One mole of X is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of X. Well, one dozen of X is 1.2 times 10 to the one of X. So in some sense, you could think of this as, okay, well, how many eggs does it take to properly egg one car or how many dozen eggs. You can say maybe it's half a dozen, maybe it's two dozen. What you're not going to do is relate it weight to weight. So what I will say is here, if you're so nefarious that you're going to egg somebody's car and, you know, be a criminal like that, which I'm not advising you do, you're not going to relate the weight and the weight, right? You know, it, if I were to do this, which I, I have never done, but you know, maybe, maybe I'm nefariously dreaming some night and I think of how to egg my, my student's car because they did so poorly on my exam. Kidding. Um, but let's say I wanted to egg a friend's car. Well, I'm not going to say, okay, well, this car, I think it weighs about two tons or you know, one ton or something. So I guess I need some proportional weight of eggs. Okay, I need to go to the grocery store and make sure I get at least half a ton of eggs. You'd never do that, right? You, you might think to yourself, okay, well, one for every window and one for every handle or something. I don't know. Um, and an extra two for the headlights. Who knows? But it would not be a weight to weight. It would be a number to number. It's like, how many cars do you need to egg? <laughs> okay, enough about vandalizing. We're not encouraging vandalism. Hopefully that illustration, however, can help you have a very tangible picture stuck in your face of 
why moles are important. And it's just like dozen. Just remember that if you have any issues. Okay. So one mole of hydrogen then is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd hydrogen atoms. We have the atomic weight, which is the atomic mass per one atom. That's essentially equal to how many grams per mole of that atom there are. So if we have the atomic mass here of hydrogen, and you have one mole of hydrogens, then that's how many grams that mole of hydrogens weighs. Again, you should know this, just a quick review here. I expect you to know this. If you do have any issues, happy to help you through them. Um, and that's why I'm giving you this time to kind of reflect, make sure you are comfortable with all of this. Molar concentrations are going to be very common. It's going to be moles per liter, be capital M. If we ever put brackets, these brackets here denote that we are using molar concentration. So do not assume or do not use mass units if there's brackets. You have to convert into molar units if you see brackets. Okay, uh, number of units. That this is one more um, type of uh, unit that I would like to address real quick is kind of the the number of concentration. So a number of germs per volume. A lot of times we'll see like this thing kills 99% of germs. This is on a numbers basis. This is not on a, we tried every germ that exists and it kills all of them except a few. And that, so 1% of all germs. No, this is, you take one germ, one type of germ, you grow a lot of them and see, okay, can this bleach or whatever, can it kill it? Um, how long does it take before 99% of them are dead of that type? This is actually the type of experiment we do a lot. Uh, in my research, in my lab. Okay, so a lot of times we'll, we will be counting this in terms of like colony forming units. So bacteria can grow into little colonies that we can see with our eyes, or maybe in the case of a virus, we'll do plaque forming units. So this might be per liter or per milliliter. For disinfection, we are often comparing like an initial amount of number per volume of the pathogen or the virus or bacteria and compare that with the final after our treatment. So that'll be an N versus N naught. And so if we do N divided by N naught, if that equals 0 0.01, that means that um, only 1% remain alive or viable or whatever. And so that means that 99% or destroyed or removed. Okay, so there's going to be um, a fair a fair number of conversions that I expect you to be able to do like this. So one minus n over n naught gives you that fraction removed. because you know this is the fraction remaining. It's if N is what's remaining after treatment and N naught was what you had before treatment, then this ratio is just that fraction remaining. So to get the fraction that was removed or gotten rid of or whatever, however you wanna say it, that would be one minus N over N naught. So there's gonna be some things like that. We'll work through it with you, but I do expect you to be able to do that kind of stuff and to be thinking along those lines in your problem solving. Okay, so I just elaborate that on here. And one other note, you probably remember this, but we often will talk about log reduction. So a three log reduction means we're essentially moving three decimal places. Um, so three logs, log of that fraction remaining, if that is minus three, that means 10 to the minus three equals n over n naught. So that means, pardon that, that means that's equal to 0 0.001 or 99.9% removed. So that would be a three log reduction. That's a 99.9% .9 removal. 
Okay, mass balances. Again, I hope this is just pure and simple review, but what we're looking at whenever we're talking about a mass balance, which we will do a lot of in this class, is we're looking at an accumulation rate. If that accumulation rate of something in a control volume is zero, that means we're not having a net gain or a net loss of whatever constituent we're looking at, if there's no net gain or no net loss over time, then we're at steady state. If you think again about a bank account, if you're depositing the same amount that you're removing every month, then you're at steady state. Even if it's fluctuating a little bit on a monthly scale, it's steady state. If you are spending more than you are, um, you are earning, then you're, you have a negative accumulation and you risk going negative. If you have, uh, if your input is higher than your output, then you are increasing the amount in there. So think about our steady state systems in that frame of mind where you have an input rate, an output rate. And you know, when we're talking about like a personal checking account, usually the reactions, the interests in here are pretty much negligible unless maybe you've got, I don't know, either a whole lot of money in there or maybe you have some occasional overdraft fee that kind of acts like a, a net downward. Even that would, I guess, would be an output rate instead of a um, decay rate. But, you know, you could think about a student loan or something like that, but you can have growth or decay. Now, by the way, the reason, the reason that, you know, in our typical checking account, the reaction inside isn't very important is because checking accounts usually have zero interest one way or the, you know, it's, you're not gaining interest typically on a checking account. So um, it's not really, an, and it's not really enough. Even if you were gaining some, it's like 0.01% or something. And with, even with, if you had like $5,000 in there, 0.01% of 5,000 is not much to speak of. So that's not making a big difference compared to your typical expenditures and all that. Okay, at any rate, in our water treatment systems, a lot of times we will have significant growth and decay, one or the other, maybe both, and that's going to play an important part. The reason that's so important, even if we are at steady state, perhaps especially if we're at steady state, so we might have, let's say, wastewater entering a reaction, there's a decay reaction decreasing the amount of this waste product in there, it's uh, rapidly reducing it inside. And the whole point is so that our output rate of the pollutant is less than what we had to start with. Because otherwise we just discharge that, that waste, right? Um, but we also, we don't wanna do that by just accumulating more and more of this waste junk in here. First of all, like you have to have something to separate it. You can't just let it flow through if you were gonna accumulate it. Um, but, you know, most times we're going to use some process that is actively causing a decay to get rid of the stuff so that our, in our output flow, we have less of the stuff. Okay, so be thinking of mass balances in accumulation rate is related to all the inputs minus all the outputs. Maybe you have more than one output. You just add those together plus whatever reaction terms are occurring. So growth and decay uh, reaction terms. If you have multiple sources of growth, you add each of those ones in there. Okay, so a very simple um, problem here. We have a, a stream flowing at 10 cubic meters per second, has an estuary feeding into it with a flow of five cubic meters per second. Stream's concentration of chloride upstream of the junction is 20 milligrams per liter and the tributary chloride concentration is 40 milligrams per liter. Treating chloride as a conservative substance, you see that you should remember what its meaning is it's not reacting. So there's no reaction term here. And assuming complete mixing of the two streams, find the downstream chloride concentration. Okay. This is a very simple mass balance. We already eliminated the 
any potential for reaction rates. So take a look, make sure that you can do this on your own. Uh, we will pick up here next time and I'll work through it with you just to be absolutely certain that um, we can handle this mixture of two streams and really start developing a methodical approach to mass balance problems. Because I think that most of you can probably intuit the answer here without even, you know, without much trouble. But if we can give you a methodical approach to answer a mass balance like this, make sure that we're defining it well and all of that, I think, I think you'll benefit from that. Okay, with that, I look forward to meeting you on Tuesday, the second week of class, and I hope you've had an enjoyable first week of classes and have enjoyed the flexibility um, that this situation has provided. Okay, we'll see you next time.